All right, we'll go ahead and get uh, get started. Thanks everybody for being here. Um, so we are in the tail end. Uh, we're going to just do a little bit of review of chapter eight, going into chapter nine with uh, Jesus healing the man who was born blind. So um, I want to review. So chapter eight, Kim uh, covered last week. Jesus's um, I am statement. I am the light of the world. You'll see that repeated in chapter 9, um, that I am the light statement is repeated two times. I kind of think John likes the light metaphor for Jesus. If you flip to the front of the book, to John 1, he uh, look at verse, just the first few verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, or, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him, not anything was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. If you flip back to the back of your Bible, to Revelation, another book, John wrote, And I saw no temple in the city, For this is uh, chapter 21, verse 22 and 23, And I saw no temple in the city, for it's, temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, who's the Lamb? It's Jesus. And the city had no need of a sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. So I think John likes this picture of Jesus as the light, and he repeats it twice. There's, I think, two I am statements that he actually repeats twice. Um, this is one of them. So, um, He may, he may have been. He may have been. Well, and, and you think about when John's writing this at the, at the end of his life, and Kim covered the end of chapter 8, but I, I want to hit it again because it's one of my favorite parts. But you think about a lot of times when we're reading through, we read the story and we kind of miss what's, what's going on for the guy writing it. So he's writing it at the end of his life. He's an old man. We talked about that the first week. And I was kind of thinking about it. His his life was probably pretty dark at the time that he wrote this book. So, so James, his brother, and Peter were Jesus's inner circle, right? So, Jesus has been killed at this point. Peter's been crucified at the time that uh, John's writing this, most likely. James, his brother, was killed uh, by the sword. Her uh, Herod killed him. Um, According to tradition, it's not, not in the Bible, but according to tradition, we think that Matthew, Andrew, and Thomas, all fellow disciples, had also been killed, also been martyred. So John is writing this, and, and we talked about how um, through you know five, six, chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8, John's making the case that Jesus is bigger than Moses. John starts his book out saying that Jesus has been there since the beginning. Everything that was made was made through him. John is, is he, he had read Matthew, Mark, and Luke at this point. And he is, I, I, I get this picture of him writing this book or, or dictating this book thinking, you know, you killed Peter, you killed James, you've killed a lot of my friends, but he doesn't shy away from the gospel. He doubles, doubles down. He, he comes after everything that got all of his friends killed, um, which is, is bold. I don't know that I would have the courage to, to do that. So, um, yes. I think they'd they'd already already seen. So he had oh, healed the guy at the pool. Like do something, do something to him. Right 
I think um, he says period periodically, you know, you've you've seen how many signs am I going to have to do for you to believe? There's some people that just believe when he calls them, right? When he called the disciples, just come and follow me. They just like Matthew just believed, just went with him. Um, I don't know why he didn't do that. Maybe maybe we'll ask him. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, and I think everybody Jesus encountered, he knew their hearts. Because there's sometimes where they're questioning him in their hearts, not out loud, and he calls them on it. So he he probably he may have known I could show these guys anything, and you're gonna see in chapter nine that same concept. Yeah. And he's about to do that. And he's about to do he's that. About, he's about to do that. He's yeah. about to raise somebody from the dead. And we're getting excited about that. Yeah. So, <laughs> we are. And it's not so. just Jesus that he's going to raise from the dead, right? So, so, chapter 8 I love. It's probably my favorite. So, as far as wrapping up our review, it starts off with the woman caught in adultery. Uh, it includes <clears throat> the I am the light of the world statement. It, it talks about how the truth will set you free. And then um, the, our translations of the end of chapter 8 are polite. <laughs> um, so I get this picture of John when he's writing this. Um, and I was thinking as I was, as I was studying this, John, John is Jesus' best friend. I mean, he's right there in it with him. And this is a fight that he's about to get into in, ch in the end of chapter Eight. What he's doing in, in chapter 8 and chapter 9 are going to get him killed. Uh, and John's right there with, with Jesus, and he's shoulder to shoulder with him. Um, I was thinking about, what, I, used to, I used to play baseball, and we, we were in a game with our rivals one time, and they had a kid on their team that was just a dirty player. Uh, so he... He came in high uh, he, with his cleats up and, and got one of our guys uh, at a play at second base, twisted up his knee, and the guy had to get stitches. So I, I was a pitcher. So he came, he happened to, he happened to come back up later in the game. So I had a job to do for my team, and I did that job. Uh, so, <laughs> So I threw that ball as hard as I could, and I got him right below the helmet uh, on the back. And, and so, of course, I mean, he throws this helmet down, he throws his bat down, and he, he turns to start coming at the mound. And my best friend's in center field. And before that guy made it three steps, my best friend's right next to me. <laughs> That's the picture I get of John. And I'm actually holding him back. Um, <laughs> So, so John's right next to Jesus, and I think I, 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 I hate to just skip through the end of, end of eight. Uh, we were kind of short on time last time. But Jesus says, so, so they're um, questioning Jesus because he's made a reference to Abraham. Um, and Jesus says, they, they say Abraham is their father. He says, if you were Abraham's children... You would be you'd be doing what Abraham did, which is belief. But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing what your father did. So they're thinking, who's our father? If our father's not Abraham, you know the song that we sing as kids: "Father Abraham had many sons." That that one. They're they're sonship of Abraham was their identity as a people. So they, they believed that their Jewishness got them to heaven. So what he's doing here is questioning their very, the, the very thing that they take their national identity and pride from. And he, he's saying, no, you're, you're not them. Um, so they, they 
again say, so they say, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one Father, even God. Jesus says to them, if God were your Father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Um, and then you skip down, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. So Jesus has just called these guys, uh, he's basically called them the bastard sons of the devil, right? He's, he's saying, you're not Jewish, you're not going to heaven. This is... You're, you're the illegitimate sons of Satan. The, those are fighting words, right? Jesus, Jesus was a carpenter before there were power tools. Jesus, uh, <laughs> Jesus was, I think, a big, strong guy. I mean, he, he was helping his dad, who was a carpenter. I mean, he grew up hauling logs and things. Um, and I, I, I get the picture that this took place face to face they're probably shouting these things at this point especially their response to this because they they call him uh, they they come back at him calling him a Samaritan so they're basically calling him a, a half-breed Jew which we talked about 700 years of racism in Israel uh, at this point so there there's almost nothing that you could call a fellow Jew that would be worse than calling them a Samaritan so they come after him, but they don't even leave it at that. They say, you're, you're a Samaritan with a demon. <laughs> um, and so, so, that's, so Jesus goes on to question their, um, it, to, to, he goes back after Abraham and says, before Abraham was, I am. The Jews would have recognized that I am statement from, that's how God referred to himself. So the Jews realize Jesus is now calling himself God. And they pick up rocks to stone him. <laughs> uh, at, the, at the end of the chapter, verse 59, so they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. So I just, I, I just love that picture because John's right there in the fight with him, and that's the fight that gets Jesus killed. This is, the, this is where Jesus definitively tells the Pharisees, the guys that are going to ultimately kill him, I am God, and and you're not. You're not who you think you are, um, and that's just powerful. And then you you go into chapter nine, and and I like the first three verses of chapter nine. As he passed by, so again we don't know if this is chronological or not. Um, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So th these are Jesus' disciples. It was, common, it was a common belief in this time period that if you had some kind of affliction, especially from birth, that it was because you or your parents sinned. They actually believed that you could sin in the womb, and, and that would, as a result, you would be born with some kind of disability. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, the next verse for me had a real, uh, a, a personal impact. So Jesus answers his disciples. Uh, it was not. Jesus answered, "It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him." So, when I was about about 12 or 13, 6th to 7th grade, um, I started having seizures, uh, grand mal seizures. So I was, um, it was very, very serious stuff. And I went to a, a Christian school that I didn't have a great experience with. But we had, I had a teacher that pulled me out of class when it became known that I was having seizures, I was missing school and stuff. Um, pulled me out of class to ask what I needed to confess, why I, I, must, I must be having seizures because I was sinning. So I don't know that this mentality is, it was, was limited to this time period. I think it's still out there. Um, but I remember as a, as a 14, 15-year-old kid reading 
verse 4 there where it's, Jesus answers him, it's not sin, it's so that the works of God could be shown through him. And just thinking that, that he's talking about me there. He's, he's saying, this hardship that I'm going through, this um, really scary, tough situation, is so that God can show his works through me. So, and I, and I always go back to that when things start to happen that, that um, I struggle with or if there's a hardship that I'm going through. I, I, I go back to verse 3 there where Jesus reminds us that's happening so that God, the works of God can be shown through, through your life. So um, I don't know that that, that theology is limited to um, you sin because you're sick. I think we also use that sometimes inadvertently when we say things like God must have been watching out for us or this or that and, and maybe discount the hardship that somebody else went through. He was always watching out um, when something bad happened, an accident or a illness or a, whatever the case might be when we say, you know, oh, he, he was watching out for me. He was watching out for the other guy too, that the bad thing happened too, so that his glory could be shown through that person. So, um, this this verse to me is a reminder of that. Um, skip down to so, Jesus explains to his disciples. Skip down to verse six. Having said these things, he spat on the ground, and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. I always think, I have kind of a weird mind, I think. I always think, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I kind of picture like Jesus and Lazarus and, and the blind guy like sitting up in heaven and Lazarus is telling the story, like Jesus called out in a loud voice, and I came out of the tomb dead. And then this guy's like, wait, you use words to bring him back? You, you spit in my eye? Like, what's <laughs> 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 like, awkward. <laughs> but, uh, so that, 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 it, it's weird that he spits. But in this time period, they actually thought that saliva had healing properties, so they used spit to, to do things. So what he might be doing here is showing that the spit didn't work. Uh, what worked was when he told the guy to go wash, and he did, so it's belief and obedience, right? So um, this pool of Siloam, is, it's actually really cool. If you Google it, there's, there's photos and videos and things. We, we actually know where it is. For hundreds of years, we believed it was the wrong spot, uh, just up the hill from where it actually is. It's a smaller pool that was part of a, a Byzantine temple up there. Um, so for hundreds of years, they thought that that was what it was. Then they were doing some excavation down below, and they actually found the, the pool with steps leading down, and they had coins embedded in the rocks that were from this time period. So they. They know that they know exactly where this this pool is. The funny thing is, is it's up against a farm, and the farm is owned by a Muslim currently, um, and so he won't let him excavate further into his land. So you have about half. You have the corner of the pool basically, and then you have the dirt from his field that they haven't excavated. Um, from from what I've read, he's fairly old, so um, <laughs> we may, may be able to excavate further <laughs> in our lifetimes. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, but it's cool because you can, you can actually go and, and see a video of where this story happened and kind of picture it in your mind. So I would, I would encourage you to do that this week. Um, and it, it means scent, and it's because the water comes from another place is, is what they think. So the pool's actually filled from another uh, water source. So <coughs> skip down to, so the guy goes and washes and 
comes back seeing. And they, so skip down to verse 13. They brought him to the Pharisees. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. To me, this is laughable. This is like the earlier story. He, he's, he's given sight to a guy, and they're worried about what day of the week he did it on. <laughs> That's nonsense. But th you see how foolish you can be when pride just blinds you. Um, the, the, we'll, we'll, we'll keep going. Uh, <laughs> see. He does not keep the Sabbath. So they're calling him a sinner, if you're kind of skipping through there. Um, there is division. So there are some Pharisees that say, this might be legit. This guy was blind, now he sees. Uh, so there's division among the Pharisees. So sometimes we, we group them all together. I think there was probably some that were trying to believe, but maybe just, just couldn't quite get there. So, uh, verse 18, the Jews did not believe that he had been bo uh, born blind, so they call his parents in and ask him, is this your son who you say was born blind? So his parents actually have to come and, yeah, this is, this is our kid. Um, at this time, people were widely aware that if you proclaimed Jesus, if you believed in Jesus, you were going to be kicked out of the synagogue. The synagogue is... I mean, that's where community happens for these people. So if you're outcast from that, you are on your own. Um, you're not just cut off from being able to go to church. You're cut off from society. So you'll see in a second a, a really tough situation. So um, they, they bring the parents in and ask if uh, this is a son. They say, yeah. Um, they ask, how then does he see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for his, himself. Verse 22, his parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus Christ, he was, put, uh, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents answered, he is of age, ask him. So, parents are kind of throwing the kid under the bus, right? <laughs> and he is of age, so he can be thrown out. So, uh, there's, there's a passage, and I, I'm, I can't remember where, where Jesus basically says, he'll come between, between parents and children, brother and sister. This, is, this might be happening right there. There, he's, he's coming between them. Um, and we don't know if they ultimately believed or not. It doesn't say. But we do know that right then they feared the Jews. They feared being kicked out of the synagogue. And so they're not going to profess their belief. If they did believe, they're going to call the son. Uh, Absolutely, could be. It's it's part like parts of the world today when a kid is born with disabilities, that is shame on the family. So they they may have had a strained relationship. We know that this guy was outside begging um, at times, so they may not have even been 
taking care of them or at this time people with disabilities just, just beg. I also think sometimes it's easy for us to judge these parents because we have led relatively easy lives as Christians. We have not faced persecution uh, to the extent that it was happening here where we haven't really been cut off from anything because we pr profess Jesus. There's not a chance that they're going to stone us or kill us or, or whatever. Um, so we don't necessarily know that fear. That's right. Uh, somebody want to start reading in 24 and I'll stop you. So John 9, 24. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. They asked him, what did he say to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've already told you. You don't listen. Oh, you want to hear it again? You want to become his disciples too? You can stop right there. So, <laughs> here, here this guy's just been sold out by his parents, basically. He has the opportunity to recant. He doesn't. He says, I don't know who he is, but I was blind and now I see, which reminds us of a song that we sing sometimes. Um, and then he almost gets a little bit sarcastic with them, right? Like, do I, how many times do I have to tell you this? Uh, and I, if you put yourself in the scenario, this guy's been seeing now for a couple of hours, maybe. <laughs> and, and here he is. It's not, when this guy made the decision to believe and he went and washed and he decides that Jesus is somebody, it's not all sunshine and roses for him. It's, it's tough. He has to immediately defend his faith. We don't always have to do that. We, we get rewarded for our belief. This guy, not so much. I mean, it was immediate. He immediately had to defend it. And he was defending his faith to the, to the top faith leaders of his community. So sometimes we get this idea that we're not ready to defend our faith or we're not ready to, to publicly profess Jesus because we, you know, what if we're asked a question we don't know the answer to or something. This guy's two hours old as a Christian at this point, and here he is defending it to this guy. And, and what does he do? He says, I was blind and now I see. That's all you have to do. I, I was this way and this is what he did for me. Right, right. Um, so he goes back and forth with the Pharisees about, he's trying to use logic. He's trying to say, like, since the beginning of time, there's never been somebody healed from blindness that was born blind. So they didn't have surgeries and things like that that we have today. So he, he says, we don't have any record of this ever happening. Here this guy does it, and you're going to say he's a sinner? I don't know if a sinner could do this. They're not buying it. So they cast him out. So they, they answer him, you were born in utter sin, and you would teach us, and they cast him out. Born in utter sin is where, that's a reference to they actually believed he sinned in the womb. Um, mo several of the commentaries I read talked about the consequences back then, and that's, they, that's how they believe people develop disabilities and things like that. So, and they cast him out. Next verse is really cool. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? So Jesus heard, hey, this guy stood up to the Pharisees, and then he goes and seeks him out. That's cool. <laughs> uh, it it kind of makes you wonder what Jesus is going to do when you profess him and, and have to defend your faith. He, he immediately goes and seeks him out. Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? So, so 
think about this situation. This guy is dejected. He's outside. His parents are probably still inside. It doesn't say anything about them. So he's probably wondering, you know, now I have sight, but what am I going to do? I'm not part of my community anymore. Um, and then here's Jesus. Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, Who is he that I might believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him. It is he who is speaking to you. So think about this for a second. Uh, this guy's been seeing now for three hours, and Jesus says, you've seen him. So this guy grew up as a Jew. He grew up learning about the Messiah coming. He was part of the synagogue, so he was, he was brought up in that tradition. And now Jesus, for this guy who's newly found sight, is saying, you're looking at him. Think about the breath that that guy took, his next breath. <laughs> Isn't it kind of a gasp? Not only is, am I seeing, I am seeing the Christ. <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. And so, yeah. Did they understand that the Son of Man would be the Messiah? Right, yeah. Yeah, so he would have known. Do you, so he's asking him, do you believe in the Messiah, essentially? And he answered, who is he, uh, sir, that I may believe in him? Um, he alludes to it. I would say this is probably the, the clearest, yeah, uh, to this guy. When I read this with the kids, um, Emma asked a question, and I, I don't know that it's chronologically correct, but it's close. She said, uh, is this guy the first, is this guy the only person who the first person he saw was Jesus? And we don't know if he saw Jesus after he washed in the pool, um, but Jesus was one of the first people he saw, which is, is awesome. Um, yeah. So Jesus, you've seen him, and it's it's me. Is what he's saying, and I like to think about. I mean, that what's that next breath like for that guy? It's it, it's just this gasp, and then what does he say? Lord, I believe, <laughs> I believe, <laughs> uh, and, and he worshipped. What did right? What does that look like? Well, you, you, you kind of, yeah, I, same picture for me. I think he probably falls to his knees. He's probably maybe hugging him. And you think Jesus is probably not just standing there. So here's Jesus, you know, he's got a hand on the guy's shoulder. or, or, or he, th There's just this intimate moment with, with the two of them. That, Why didn't he become an apostle? Uh, I don't know. We don't know anything about this guy after this interaction. Um, so I'm not, he, he may have. He may have gone and, and proclaimed elsewhere. Um, we don't know what his life was like in his community after this. But we know that he defended his very early faith. 
and then Jesus rewarded him for that. And, and he gets to, one-on-one, -on -one, he gets the, the statement from Jesus that Jesus is the Messiah and he worships him. That's, to me, one of the coolest pictures that there are. The next few verses are kind of, they're strange. Um, Jesus was, he, he, his disciples were often confused by the things that he said. I think this is probably one of them that they probably talked about when he wasn't around. Um, Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. That can also be translated sin. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. I read quite a few different commentaries on that passage. I think it has to do with um, spiritual pride and and their, their high-mindedness and, and their... Uh, they held themselves in high esteem, and they thought they had all the answers. So much so that he heals a guy of blindness on the Sabbath, and they're worried about what day of the week it happened on, not this guy was blind and now he can see. Uh, and then when he's referencing those that are blind, I think that's maybe a statement of faith. right? We don't always, it's like in Hebrews where it talks about faith as um, the belief in things not seen. right? So... I think this is a reference to that kind of faith, the, the, the belief in things that you can't see versus I see everything, I know everything, and I'm some, um, someone to be respected because of my spiritual knowledge. So uh, Kim's going to handle chapter 11, or 10. Well, thanks, Brian. Uh, that, uh, I, I think... John 9 is one of the most powerful chapters in the Bible. I mean, when, when you look at that and you, and you get down to the end and you say, what's he been trying to say? It's summarized right there in, in 39. When Jesus says, for judgment I've come to the world so the blind will see and those who see will become blind. The people who are blind, who say, God, I don't understand you. Help me understand. Those people will see God. But the people who say, I've got God figured out, are the ones who won't. And you say, well, what about the part where it says about Jesus judging the world? Doesn't it say in other parts of the Bible that he doesn't judge the world? But here's the way you have to look at that. The meaning here probably is, Jesus is saying, I came to declare the condition of men. I came to declare your condition. What's your condition? Your condition is, you're blind. And if you want to see, you have to open your eyes and see me. Well, I love what Brian said about the blind man's eyes are open and what does he see? He sees Jesus. If our eyes are open, do we see Jesus? We have to be blind to see Jesus. And then what, is, what does he do right at the end of this? He goes in, in, when he's going into chapter 10, he's going to tell him a story about the shepherd. In essence, this is saying a shepherd can see his flock. But blind people, blind people can't see the shepherd, but they trust him to lead him. So the shepherd makes a lot of sense. Now we have to realize this man born blind is one of the last signs in the book of John. There's only going to be one sign after this. And that sign is going to be the most powerful sign that Jesus gives people. Because remember, John wrote these signs down. He chose these among the multitudes, I think, of miracles he could have chosen. 
He chose these and put them in a specific order in his story. So don't think this is arranged chronologically. Chronology has nothing to do with what John's trying to tell us. John is trying to build a case that Jesus is the I am. He's trying to get us to see who Jesus is. And so he typed, remember his first sign was the wedding at Cana. And his last sign is going to be, well, some would argue, his eighth sign is his own resurrection. But the seventh sign is the resurrection that we're going to see too. So let's talk about the shepherd and his flock just briefly. He talks in chapter 10 about a man doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate. If he doesn't enter it by the gate, he's a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the sheep. The shepherd. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So, tell me if he's still thinking of the Pharisees, who are the robbers? The Pharisees, of course, are the robbers. What are they robbing from people? Exactly, the ability to know Jesus. They're uh, robbing from people their ability to know Jesus. Because what are the Pharisees teaching that prevents them from seeing Jesus? They're teaching you have to follow Moses and the laws of Moses to be able to get to Jesus. What is Jesus saying? He says they're blind by just following the law blindly. Even when you read the Old Testament, I will argue that God never in the Old Testament argues for you to follow the law blindly. He wants you to follow the law because he wants to capture your heart. And you know, in Hebrews, it talks a lot about that, why we were given the law, right? We're given the law because we're like children. When my children were little, I gave them laws. Don't touch the stove. Why did I tell them that? Because I loved them. Now, now I wish they would touch the stove. <laughs> right? Because I could use a good meal now and then. <laughs> call me, have your kids call up and say, Dad, I'm coming over to cook today? You go, whoa, I might fall over dead. <laughs> no. You give your kids laws because you're trying to help them understand these are good things to do. You try to teach them, you go to school and I want you to do well in school because you try to say, I want you to learn to read. Yeah, reading's good. I want you to learn to do math. Yeah, math is good. But what, what do you really want them to do? You really want them to develop a passion for life that says, ah, Dad, I love to read. Wouldn't that be great? That's what, that's what you really want them to come home from school saying. I love to read. I love math. I just love the way numbers work. When they have a good teacher, that's what happens. All right? Because good teachers don't teach them how to do math. They teach them to love math. Good teachers teach your children how to love reading, not just how to read. Good teachers teach your children not just how to sing, but to love to sing. God is trying through laws in the Old Testament to teach his people to love him. That's what it's always been about. 
and they misunderstand him over and over. And that's why you find statements in the Old Testament that says, God says he is tired with your stupid offerings. Now you've got to think about that. Why are they stupid offerings? He told us, he told people in the Old Testament to bring offerings. So what is he then telling me he's tired of their offerings? Because they're being done with the wrong attitude. God wants us throughout time to learn to love him and to do things because we love him. That's hard. It's hard to teach your kids and it's hard for God to teach us because we're very slow learners. And we are blind. We are blind in our lives that the only thing that we see is God wants me to follow a bunch of rules. That's nonsense. We've missed the point. So when he says, you're blind, he's not saying the Pharisees aren't following the rules and the law of Moses. He's saying your heart is in the wrong place. You got to get your heart in the right place so you can see. And when you see God, then you fall at his feet and you do like the blind man did and you say, Lord, I worship you. Well, I, I, I like that part. I think my favorite part of the story is where the blind man argues with him in verse 30. Don't you love that part? In verse 30, the blind man is going to teach these Pharisees who have studied the law all their life. This guy hasn't been able to study anything. He's just been sitting by the gate begging. And, and, and his discourse to them is stunning. He says to them, the blind man says, you don't know where he comes from, but he opened my eyes. We know God doesn't listen to sinners. He listens to godly men who does his will. Nobody's ever heard of the opening eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And to that they replied, you're steeped with sin at birth, from sin at birth. They go back to their first argument that you must be sinful. He just educated them. Oh, that, this is... He tried. <laughs> I, I think that's the key. Now, I, I've got to tell you that in our, um, in our life group on Thursday night, uh, we decided to have a discussion about Amendment 106 about the right to die. And that's a, an interesting discussion because you have to think about that because... Uh, all of you, I'm sure, have been in the situation that I've been, where I, I walk over to my dad and, when, and he says, can I just die? I'm ready to go home, just let me die. And one of the arguments, of course, we had was, well, yeah, I can let you die by withholding things, but in 106, we're saying, I'm going to give you a pill to let you die. Now, my, my dad, of course, went further. He said, next time you come, could you bring a gun? <laughs> well, and he got in trouble when he told that to the nurse. When, when she said, Mr. Natalia, is there anything I can get for you? And he said, yeah, get me a gun. And, of course, then she had to report that. And then she reported it, and then the psychologist came in, and then they called me and said, you know your dad is suicidal? I said, he's not suicidal. <laughs> he just wants to kill himself. <laughs> you know, so, so you're thinking of all those things, and then you think of this story of the man born blind. And dad would ask me, why am I still alive? Have you ever talked to somebody who said that to you? 
Why am I still alive? What am I doing here? And what this story teaches us is that a lot of times you're not alive because of something God's trying to teach you or something you did wrong or right. You're alive so the works of God can be shown to other people. Now, I'll tell you what my dad taught me. My dad taught me how to die. Because he didn't take a pill. Or I didn't bring him a gun. He taught me how to die because he had to go through some agony. But he wouldn't take his own life. And I saw what it is to die. I needed to learn something. Why was he alive? <laughs> this man had spent his whole life, this blind man, spent his whole life wondering, why is this happening to me? And Jesus says, it's happening to you so I can work my power through you. Our life isn't about ourselves. It's about God doing things through us. And sometimes it has nothing to do with who we are or why we're alive. And it has everything to do with Jesus showing other people things to us. Thanks, Brian. That was, uh, that was amazing. Next week we'll pick up with chapter 10. See you then.